Hi, Glenn Lowry here with an exciting announcement about the future of The Glenn Show. As of today, August 1st, this show and my Substack newsletter will be sponsored by the Manhattan Institute, a highly regarded think tank that develops and disseminates new ideas that foster greater economic choice and individual responsibility. I've been a fellow at the Manhattan Institute for some time, and deepening our relationship now is a natural move that will allow the Glenn Show to grow and innovate while continuing to deliver the quality content that you've come to expect. I talk in more detail about this partnership at the end of today's episode in my exchange with John McWhorter, and we'll do so in next week's episode when my guest will be Manhattan Institute President Raihan Salam. But you'll start to see some changes immediately. From time to time, I will have other Manhattan Institute fellows on the show to talk about their work. And the Substack will occasionally feature content from the Institute's publication, City Journal, when I feel it would be of interest to my audience. You'll start to see the Manhattan Institute logo on the podcast and the Substack. This signifies the mutual commitment we've made to each other. But I want to be clear. I maintain full editorial control of everything that goes on at The Glenn Show and at glennlowry.substack.com. No one at the Manhattan Institute is looking over my shoulder. I would have it no other way, and neither would they. I want to say a word about everyone who has been supporting this endeavor through subscriptions at Substack. Believe me, your subscriptions have been and continue to be vital to the success of The Glenn Show. Thank you. One of the things I'm most proud of is the community that has developed around my podcast and newsletter. What I'm doing here is bigger than me. And it would be nothing without you. I want to show my appreciation by sharing the wealth. And so starting this month, I'll be lowering my subscription fees. That's right, lowering my fees in a time of inflation. You'll now be able to subscribe for $6 a month instead of seven. And in an even better deal for $50 for the annual subscription instead of $70. Those of you who have already paid for an annual subscription will benefit, who've paid at the old rate, will benefit by receiving an extra three months for free in order to make up the difference. I'm incredibly excited about what the future holds for the Glenn Show and for our new partnership with the Manhattan Institute. And so I'm glad to have you, my listeners, viewers, and readers, here with me. Thank you. Hello, everybody. This is Glenn Lowry. You have tuned into The Glenn Show. Uh, we are sponsored by the Manhattan Institute for Policy Research in New York City. More about that later. I'm with John McWhorter, my regular conversation partner every other week. And we're honored uh, this week to have Richard Wolf, the political economist, the economist emeritus professor from the University of Massachusetts, currently visiting professor at the New School University in a program in international affairs, um, and an economic journalist and public uh, intellectual and social commentator of some formidability, if I may say so, a weekly radio show, what do you call it, weekly update or economic update with Richard Wolf, right. publishes in the monthly review on a regular basis, uh, is also uh, a, a well-published uh, academic uh, Marxian, if I may say so, Richard Economist, uh, writing in the tradition of Marx. And, you know, we don't get a Marxist on the show here every week, Richard, so a specially warm welcome to you. Well, that's very kind of you. You know, having uh, lived all my life in the United States, I was born in a place called Youngstown, Ohio, 
which is a, a victim of American capitalism uh, in terms of what it was when I was born there and what it became uh, shortly thereafter. Um, I'm a product of the same elite systems that both of you uh, are part of, um, but I, I took a different turn. I kept asking the question about the system, and I kept asking questions that were critical. And what I discovered was that my professors, and I was reading their eyes more than what they said, they were upset with my questions. They were, as best I could tell, afraid. Afraid not of, of, the, of the particular point that was being made, but afraid of getting into an interaction that would involve them being either knowledgeable about Marxism or interested in it or something. And I could read from their eyes a kind of pleading uh, for me not to pursue this. And since many of my teachers were perfectly nice people that I liked and all of that, I didn't want to make trouble. So I learned that here in the United States, if you find uh, capitalism less than attractive, and if you find the Marxian critique particularly useful, these are two bits of information you better keep to yourself. Uh, and so that was my mantra and my way of living until two things happened that might interest you. One, the University of Massachusetts, in a bizarre departure from the norm, decided way back in the 1970s, the height of the Cold War, really, if you think about it, to hire a group of us, not only despite our left-wing leanings, but because of them. We were actually uh, recruited, effectively, to go there. Um, I'm a city boy, and Amherst, Massachusetts, in case you haven't visited, is not an urban space, uh, to say the least. And so I, I actually never went there. <laughs> I never lived in Amherst. I lived most of my uh, time there in the city of New Haven, which is a city. Um, and I had moved there because of Yale and all that. Um, and then you in the commuted. last, I commuted. That's right. I drove up and down. If you know the area, I-91 from New yeah. Haven in the south, to about an hour and a half each way. Yeah. Um, and then 10 years ago, uh, everything in this country changed. And suddenly what I had to say, which wasn't all that different from what from what I had said 20 years earlier, was suddenly interesting to people in a way I had never experienced in my life. This is uh, Occupy Wall Street and so That's on. That's right, exactly right. Right about that time, 29, 2010, uh, just leading up to Occupy. Uh, and suddenly, I mean, you know, over the last 10 years, I have this radio and TV show, I, I, everything I write, people publish it right away, you know, it's all kind of crazy uh, switch from being very much marginalized, kept at a healthy distance, uh, looked at peculiarly, uh, you know, sort of the kind of situation where people speculate, if not openly, then to one another, did his mother drop him on his head when he was a little baby or something like that. Uh, to suddenly, you know, I'm, I'm okay. I, my perspective is now somehow inside the boundary of what's tolerable, whereas before I was outside. Interesting Richard, story. Now, I want to get a quick question in. In your view, under your philosophy, under your sense of prescriptions, how could things have gone better for more people in Youngstown? and in similar places, you know, the prototypical story that we're talking about. What should have happened instead of what did happen? Oh, that, that's a great question. There are at least two things that should have happened, uh, in my view, and that could have changed the history of Youngstown, of Ohio, of the whole Midwestern industrial, you know, Detroit, Cleveland, all of that. Um, two things, I would say. Number one, a rational planning mechanism for what to do about a pretty well-known problem. Capitalism's been around for three, 400 years, if you 
dated in the 17th, 18th century in England, and then it spreads. Wherever it has spread, it shows a pretty similar history. Whatever the industry is that gets them off the ground, whether it's cotton textiles or it's iron and steel or it's railroads, those things peter out after 10 years, 20, 40, 60 sometimes. Uh, capitalism is a very dynamic system. It'll move on. It'll move on to a different industry. It'll move on to a different technology. It'll move on to a different region of the world. Nobody is or should be surprised by this. You ought to be able, therefore, to conceptually sit down and say, okay, what are we going to do so that when the shift comes, to a new technology or a new region, we don't leave disaster in its wake. We don't see all the capital vanish, move to another place. Uh, good news for the place it moves to, but a disaster for the place it left behind, that doesn't have to happen. And we even know some cases where it worked out in the sense, not by planning, but by the way the market works, which means we're talking 30, 40 years of misery, and then slowly out of the misery comes a new plant, a new industry for a while. You know, New England was once an industrial area. It isn't that anymore. It becomes healthcare or research or university. Or, well, all of those things could have been, should have been worked out through a national conversation and a national planning program. The second thing I would argue, which is even more important for me, is that, and here my Marxism comes, I mean, you know, this is not me. I didn't invent any of this. I'm just applying what I learned from a good teacher. Um, many good teachers, but Marx was one of them. Uh, you, you, you cannot organize an economic system that purports to serve what people need if you don't put the people in charge. There is something fundamentally amiss in organizing enterprises in the following specifically capitalist way. A very small group of people sit at the top of virtually every business, large, medium, small whether you call them the owner or the owning family or the partnership or the corporation. It is a very small group of people. Board of directors of typical corporations have 15 uh, men and women on them. Major shareholders, about the same number. Uh, but the employees, the vast mass of us, we are in a subordinate position. We do not elect the people who run the enterprise. We have no authority to recall them if they perform in a way we don't want. And so we have a system in which the mass of the apparatus of production, of the goods and services without which we cannot survive, is controlled by a tiny, unaccountable minority of people. If you look at the population statistics of the U.S. Census, employers in this country are less than 1% of the people. Employees is everybody else. And we allow a 1% unelected, unaccountable minority to make all the decisions. They decided to leave Youngstown, that tiny group. And the rest of Youngstown, my family included, uh, was left without a job, without a future. You know, many of the people of Youngstown that I grew up with moved to Detroit and Cleveland where they went through the same thing again five or ten years later. I mean, you know, and you know this story because it has proliferated for the last 75 years. So my argument, I'll end with this, my argument is we have an economic system that works for the people who run it. It works perfectly nicely for them but not for us. And if we want the system to work better for us, then we have to be in charge. And what you need is a worker cooperative to run the business, not a capitalist enterprise that puts all that unaccountable power at the top. And for a country that talks about democracy, every fourth word to, to face the following reality, which I doubt you can refute, 
that we have organized the production of goods and services in enterprises that have never allowed democracy in the front door. When you walk across the threshold into your factory or your office or your store, you give up your democratic rights. You are told, sit over there, work with that machine, do the, and at five o'clock, get your rear end out of here, go home, watch TV, two pieces of pizza, and come back tomorrow and do it all again. Whoa. This is not what democracy ever meant. And if you don't okay, Richard, your Richard. economy that way, how do you claim that your society is democratic? democracy? Glenn, what do you have to say there? Yeah, I'm, I'm going to say something. I'm not going to try to rebut <laughs> this well-polished and well-rehearsed <laughs> indictment of the, of the uh, current order of politics and, and economics. I'm not going to try to rebut it. I hear it. I understand it. I, I want to ask some questions, though. Please, please. I want, I, I want you to deal with the concerns uh, initially articulated by Friedrich von Hayek about planning and the problems with planning, with centralized planning, about the information, about the politicization of economic decisions. And I want you to address that. I don't have to spell it out any further than that. The other thing I want to say, though, is that if I have a business, I start a business, I have some capital, I open up an enterprise, and I hire some people, it's still my business. That's my property. The fact that I entered into a labor relationship with somebody did not give them title over my property. What is it that's so special? Here's my question about the employment relationship. Now, if I'm selling them widgets and they're buying widgets from me, I don't get a vote on their board of directors because I'm selling them widgets. If I'm buying from them in large bulk and keeping them afloat, I likewise don't own their company. Why is it that a worker, in virtue of working, is entitled to have some say about what I do with my property, including picking it up and moving it from Ohio to Arizona? Okay. Which do you want me to respond to first? Uh, Hayek. 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 Okay. Um, let's begin with, with, with one premise. Are there problems with planning? Absolutely. There are problems, as far as I can gather, having studied this all my life, with every particular system that we have so far seen the human race create, whether it's ancient village economies, slave systems, feudal systems, capitalist systems. They're unique and they're distinct one from the other, but problems they all have. Uh, we're not going to... Well, let's put it another way. If you're searching for the economic system that has no problems, I wish you every good luck imaginable, but I doubt you'll find them because what you're doing is searching for elephants in the Berkshires, and I happen to know there aren't any there. Uh, you, every, you know, it's like with, with, with if you advise teenagers uh, about love and marriage, and they say, well, I, I'm so unhappy because I'm single, I want to go find a partner and, and be connected. And you have to explain to them gently and, and warmly, I hope, uh, that when you get married, you do not end your problems. You are exchanging one set of problems, those that go with single life, for another set. But if you're hoping that you'll have no problems, then the prospects for your marriage are not really that good because you're going to be upset. So yeah, socialism or whatever comes after capitalism will have its problems, its contradictions, its dynamics. Mr. Hayek tried to suggest that there was um, the following kind of problem. Uh, the central authority, the planners, and just a footnote here, no one in the world of socialist planning ever imagined or affirmed, to my knowledge, that the planning of a socialist economic system would have to be done at the top. The practical matter in Russia and several other countries was that they did it that way. That was a choice they made. But there can be decentralized planning. There can be mixtures of centralized and decentralized planning. And by the way, as socialists have jokingly said to themselves a million times, the best examples of planning are not the ones that the Russians and the Chinese have accomplished. 
it's the ones that were accomplished uh, by the Walmart Corporation, by GE, who took an immense amount of operational decision making out of the market. Let's remember, when companies merge, when companies acquire another one, yeah. if you talk to them, they'll tell you they don't want to rely on the uncertainties of the market. It's too risky. They need to bring inside their planning operation what well, was this is Coast. This is Roundup Coast. This is Oliver That's Williamson. That's right. That's right. So let me simply say we have two reasons uh, to look at this in a different way. When you do planning, you will make mistakes. When you don't do planning, you will make mistakes. The mistake Mr. Hayek made was to imagine that the debate was which system didn't make mistakes. And if, with all due respect to a person who can't defend himself, I think that's nuts. There is no such system. There we go back with the elephants in the Berkshires. There's loads of mistakes made wow. when you decentralize in each little entrepreneur the decision what am I to do? You make a decision that undercut, for example, if I leave Youngstown, I make my decision. But that means that the local bowling alley has nobody going there to, to throw the ball down the alley. And therefore, I'm going to drive that person out of business. I didn't want that. I didn't intend it. That may not be good for 27 things. But to justify it all as if in the end, by some magic, this all turns out to be efficient. Well, that that's that's silly. You know, that, that, yeah, OK, that, that's just, just very briefly, just briefly before you address the second one. So what my teachers from graduate school back at MIT in the 70s would have said is that there is, excuse me, John, a difference between a pecuniary externality and a objective externality. So the monetary effect on, on no, there's a secondary market, the baker whom you no longer buy bread from when you moved your business from Youngstown. That's a pecuniary externality. He's supposed to go out of business if at the end of the day, there's not enough demand for bread in Youngstown because of other economic forces. Uh, but, but, the, the failure of the sort of pure Hayekian kind of decentralized private market decision making from physical externalities like I belch smoke into the atmosphere and other people have to breathe it won't be corrected without planning, whereas the pecuni externality oughtn't to be corrected by planning. That, that's the observation that I right. want to make. And the, uh, if I could, I say something about that. Yeah, sure. The problem with the pecuniary. Briefly. Yes, sir. The problem with the pecuniary is if we're going to pretend, which is what I think we're doing, that there's efficiency in capitalism, then there would have to be a demonstration that the extra profit earned by the company that decides to leave Youngstown is not smaller than the losses incurred pecuniary by all the victims of what that move might be. In the absence of an attempt to demonstrate that that's the case, and that absence is what we normally have, the claim that it's a reasonable or efficient outcome has no merit. It, it, it can't be sustained. It's simply an assertion to get the student whose hand is in the air saying, wait, 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 wait a minute, how many bakers with how much fallout are in trouble when one company leaves? You know? Okay, okay. Uh, I'll, I'll stipulate that. Okay. Um, I just want to say one more thing before I ask you to address the second part Good. of my concern, which was about property. Right. And the other thing I want to say is what about history? A lot of people would say, look at the history of the 20th century, where large scale planning has been implemented under the rubric of socialism in developing countries left and right. We have seen stagnation and we have seen worse where relatively free market forces have been allowed to uh, hold sway, as in China, we have seen growth and we have seen, and Korea and Singapore, and we have seen growth and we have de seen development. The tragedy of Africa is in part a political ideological tragedy of the, tra so this argument would go, you know how this argument yes. uh, uh, would be developed. So uh, what about that? Isn't the historical record, it, uh, not so friendly to the socialist uh, ambition? 
No, I think the historical record has been rewritten in order to be unfriendly, but that in fact that you can't sustain that. I mean, here's the, the bald basic reality. In the 20th century, the most spectacular achievement of economic growth, not of other things, but of economic growth in the normal measurement, GDP, annual growth per year, blah, blah, all of that. The, the, the number one achievement of the 20th century was the Soviet Union. And the number one achievement of the 21st century is the People's Republic of China. Now, you ought to wonder a little bit about what the, the empirical record tells you if that sentence I just uttered is correct. And I assure you that it is. If you look at what the Soviet Union was in 1917 when it begins and what it was in 1989 when it ends and ditto for China 1949 of the revolution to today, these are growth experiences we have never seen before, especially if you count the contradictory events, the wars and the other problems they had to surmount in, in both cases along the way. Their record of achievement of economic growth is the envy of the, no capitalist country has done it. And they've certainly not done it in the compressed amount of time that Russia and China achieved it. That's the real, I mean, I don't, I have criticisms of those societies. That's not the point. But on the ground- okay, I'm, not, I'm not qualified to rebut you, but I got my doubts, okay? okay I, no, I just no, want to please, go on the record. I, uh, let, me, let me give you a suggestion. 20 years ago, I published a book with my colleague, Steve Resnick, published by Routledge Publishers in England called Class Theory and History, Capitalism and Communism in the Soviet Union. Spent 10 years of my life studying exactly what happened in the Soviet Union, why it grew the way it did, and why it fell apart the way it did. And, and you know, I, I really do know this material. Let's let John into the conversation. Goes, it, it, and the Chinese, I mean, that's our world. Our world is being transformed today by what that yeah. country was able to do. It dwarfs the Soviet Union. It, uh, you know, what, Richard, the achievement uh, of China is the is the elephant in the room, if I could say. John. So. Anyway, I still Richard, owe you an I'm, answer. Glenn, I owe you. Yeah, an I am not. Any, okay, you do, but I John, I want to let John back All in. Right, oh, John. Very, very, very quick question. I don't know anything about economics, but. Well, I know, I know about this much, but based on what you're saying, so let's talk about, you know, say the Soviet Union, the former Soviet Union in China. We all know there's been a great deal of misery in those places, despite the growth that you're talking yes. about, which nobody can. Couldn't, this is a genuine question. Couldn't a Martian anthropologist look at this thing called the United States of America, not Youngstown, Ohio, but the United States of America and see maybe not growth along the lines of what happened to Russia throughout the 20th century or China 10 minutes ago, but looking at how our you know economy grows and is more efficient, et cetera, and think, well, that's unfortunate about the bakers in Youngstown. That was a local issue. That was a tragedy, but in general terms, even with lack of planning, we grew. That's what I imagine a, a Martian anthropologist, a Martian economist might see. Am I incorrect? No, you are correct. We grew. This economy here in the United States, for example, if you take the last half set, the last 50 years, uh, post-World War II to the present, this economy grew. No, by the way, over the last 30 years, which is what the period that I study and that I know, just so you know, the average uh, growth of GDP in the U.S. over the last 30 years, about two, two and a half percent per year. Over the exact same period of time, the average rate of growth of the Chinese GDP was six to nine percent per year, roughly three times sustained for an entire generation. We've never seen such a thing. So, yes, we grew. But here's the other side of the growth here. And the, the Chinese have their problems. I don't want to be boxed in. I'm not celebrating everything in China as wonderful. I mean, that, that's childish. I, you know, I'm, that's not my view. I have a lot of criticisms of Russia, China, and all of that. But, but I want to be clear on what they did, what they didn't do, et cetera, et cetera. The Chinese uh, achievement comes in contrast to what happened here. The average real wage in China, I'll use that as a symbol number, you know, that's the wage of the money they get adjusted for the prices they have to pay, the real wage. 
The Chinese real wage over the last 25 years has quadrupled. The, ch the real wage of the American worker over the last 30 years has gone absolutely nowhere. The real wage of the American worker today is roughly what it was in the late 1970s. So what you have well, well, we're, is a... We're at different stages of development, right? I mean, the U.S. in the late I 19th bet. and early 20th century was also uh, extraordinary amongst industrializing countries in terms of growth rates. The China of today is more like the U.S. of uh, 1890 or 1910, something like that. Right. And the, the United States at that time of growth, even though it didn't achieve the rates of growth of the Chinese, achieved good rates of growth. And that was a tremendous challenge for the dominant economy of the world at that time, which was the British Empire. And we saw what happened. One empire collapsed, that's Britain, which has now become what it once was, a small, wet, cold offshore island from the continent of Europe. And the Chinese are doing to this country what we did to the British, only the difference is the British have a century of denying it. The Americans are only getting into it now to deny what's happening to them by talking about China as if it weren't happening again. But you're quite right. The parallels are striking. Now, what about my second question, which is I started the company. It belongs to me. A guy that works for right. me does not own my company. Right. Right. Here's the problem. You put investment, you put some money, some time, some energy into setting up that business and, and all of that. But so do all of your workers. They, for example, they moved from X to Y. They took their children out of this school and put them into that school. They made all kinds of life decisions with enormous consequences for other people as part of your business. That's what gives them entitlement. You I paid them. I, yes, you pay I, them. And they the give guy that's, that wait a minute. The guy that sells me them. raw material. You pay them. The guy that sells me the guy that sells me raw materials also had to do a lot of prep work in order to get me my coal or to get me my steel ingots or to, or whatever. He doesn't own my business for that. Why is it we had a contract? The worker delivered eight hours a day of labor power, and I delivered $100,000 or $1,000 or $5. We had a contract. They didn't, they didn't own my property because they were on the other side of that contract for me. There's something special about labor, I'm guessing, in the Marxian tradition. There's something that is normatively significant about surrendering my blood, sweat, and tears as a worker, that gives me a claim more so than anybody who just sold me a widget to help me do my business. Well, I mean, you can go that route. A lot of Marxists like to go that route. I'm not one of them. I see, it seems to me, I like the language of modern capitalism about stakeholders. A business has a lot of people that have a stake in it. The particular qualities of their stake vary. Somebody brings the money. And we don't ask the question in capitalism, where did you get the money from? Did you steal it? Did you inherit it? Did you swindle John over there for it? We pretend that that doesn't matter. I, I'm okay with that, as long as we don't lie about what we're doing. So you bring money, however you acquired it. But the other person brings eight hours a day. You give them some money and they give you eight hours a day, but you want to be recognized, well, I conceived of the business, I worry about the business, I ri but they take risks, and they made commitments, and they've okay. drawn other people in, and we all have a stake. Why are you the only one who's in a position to say, business is over, I'm leaving? Whoa, you're not the only one who's invested into this. The whole community is dependent on this. I'm not going to even go into all the ways you, as the business owner, have asked for and gotten the road to be repaired, yeah. the taxes to be, you know, all of that. You didn't build this, as President Obama famously and, put and it. <laughs> he was exactly right. He was exactly right. Okay, uh, I got to ask you... You, got a lot you, of you promised us 30 minutes and you've given us 30, but if you'll let me ask, Absolutely. if you'll let me ask Keep this. Going. Sure, sure. Is it my, is my impression wrong that the left 
doesn't sync with the working class of America culturally as much as it should, and that you got a lot of working class voters, uh, you know, what's wrong with Kansas or whatever, voting against their interests because the left, I'm going to call it cultural Marxism, and you can correct me if I put it wrong, but because they run roughshod over the relatively culturally conservative sensibilities of a ethnic working class, an urban working class, a unionized working class and whatnot, that the class consciousness that otherwise might emerge that would fuel on the ground a serious uh, left political movement is, is to some degree hampered by this cultural disconnect. Mostly I agree with you. In other words, I would, m most of what you said, I might inflect it a little bit differently. But yes, I think it's a valid criticism of the left in the United States that its relationship uh, to the working class that it once had that it had coming out of the Great Depression, for example, uh, at least a lot better than it has it now, um, that's a, de a major deficit. It's a major flaw. It's a major weakness. It's what hampers it. it. It is what in the recent years has turned enormous part of the American working class, not all, but an enormous part of it, uh, to explore the right wing, to be uh, induced by, uh, by a Trump or by all the other uh, forms of that kind of mentality and that kind of politics. Horrible for people like me to watch and to see uh, the lost opportunity. But, but let me plead with you to understand at least one dimension of this whole process. At the, the way to begin this for me is to remember what happened in the 1930s. We had a meltdown, we had the great crash of 1929 into the early 30s. You'd savage the working class. Unemployment in 1933, 25%, six times what it is today, and it's bad today, but try to imagine what would six times larger be. And what we had was a working class that went to the left. It joined the CIO with a unionizing drive the work we have never seen in this country before, and we never saw since. You had two socialist parties and a communist party working together with the CIO. You had 40 million Americans basically mobilized on the left. They went to the president, a kind of namby-pamby Roosevelt who got in as a centrist, sort of like Biden, uh, and he changed overnight because he had a real constituency that came to him and said in so many words, either you do something for us or you're not going to be president much longer because we, we're going to withdraw support. You're not that different from Herbert Hoover. So what do we get? In very short time, three, four years, Social Security, we never had that before. Unemployment compensation, we never had that before. The first minimum wage in this country, we never had that before. And a government jobs program that hired 12 to 15 million people, and we had never had that before either. The left was able to achieve not only all those things, but who paid for it? You had the biggest tax increase on rich people and corporations in our country's history. I don't know, you know how much of this you know, but in 1942... Oh, I know it. All right. In 1942 to 44, Roosevelt sent messages to the Congress proposing in the State of the Union that the maximum income tax bracket be 100%. If you earned over 20... I didn't know that. Yep. If you earn over $25,000 back then, which would be roughly $400,000 a year now, if you earned more than $25,000, the government, according to the president, would take all of it. That's the way. It was. And he made a speech. If I'm not going to send young men and women over to fight a war while you guys are making money. They're just, we're not going to do that. Okay, I see the I You see, see the where I'm going. I mean, th there is an incentive problem with 100% tax rate. Yes, there is an incentive problem yeah. with it, and then there are all the problems if you don't do it. But let me finish the point. After World War II, the, the right wing in this country was traumatized. They had been forced to watch themselves taxed and borrowed from to take care of the mass of people. They didn't like it. They didn't want it. They hated it. Then they saw it capped in World War II when the United States was allied with the Soviet Union, as if 
you know, the worst nightmare imaginable to these, you know, John, uh, what was that guy's name? Birch, the John Birch Society, all those other uh, right-wing extremists. So we've had then the worst repression imaginable. We've had a 75-year repression of anything having to do with all of that, which is socialist, communist, anarchist, terrorist, all of these things are synonyms. In large, large parts of the country, you get a liberal, that's another synonym. You have terrorized the population to go nowhere near there, which is, brings us back to the beginning of this conversation. That's why I, as a young man, have to kind of lowball and understate my interest in Marx, because even though I went to Harvard and Yale and all the rest of that, with all that pedigree, people still kept a healthy distance, like I had some kind of bad body odor problem. You know, I am a product of this whole system. That's why the left has been unable to figure out how to get around the kind of one-two punch that you normally have the enmity of a capitalist system because you're a radical, but now you have this added notion that you are a traitor, you're in bed with the Russians when they're the bad guys, and I don't know, now we'll be with the Chinese or the Cubans or whoever they come up with next. You know, there's a lot of digging out from a hole in this country that the left is going to do. I still think we'll, we'll get it, but it's going to take a while. Well, okay, we don't agree about everything, but we do agree that the woke, ultra-woke Democrats are standing in the way of that program that you just yes. got through enunciating. That's right. That's this has been Richard Wolf, uh, the indomitable <laughs> Richard Wolf, political economist extraordinaire. Thanks for coming on The Glenn Show, giving us some time, Richard. We really appreciate it, man. And I appreciate it that you are open enough and willing to have these kinds of conversations. This is what's been missing. I'm available. If you ever want to do this again, I would enjoy doing it. I can see from both of you that we have a lot in common anyway. Richard, please don't close your browser window until the files are 100% uploaded. Just okay. leave your window open for a bit, okay? Will do. Will do. You go ahead and ring off. John and I will continue. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very thank you, much. Richard. And thank you, John, for your forbearance as economists went head to head and uh, made you into something of a spectator. <laughs> no, I, I, I... But you did ask a couple of good questions. And I wanted to learn, and so I think I did. And, yeah, he's a good teacher, too. Yeah. So what do you okay, think? Okay, so part two of our, of our conversation uh, today, John, is uh, dedicated to the announcement uh, of the association, the new uh, partnership between the Glenn Show uh podcast and newsletter, and the Manhattan Institute for Policy Research in uh, New York City. Um, we will have more to say about that uh, in the fullness of time, but um, I just wanted to kick it around with you a little bit since you are practically a co-host of The Glenn Show, coming on every other week. Your brand and my brand are intertwined in this, uh, in this uh, marvelous world that we live in. Uh, you are teaching at Columbia and writing for the New York Times and just occasionally appearing on The Glenn Show. The Glenn Show has partnered with the Manhattan Institute. You might have feelings about that. Um, uh, you may have things that you want our audience to know about that. We want to give you an opportunity to react and, and just uh, and, and give me an opportunity to explain a little bit about, about what we're doing. But, you, you yeah. know, what are your thoughts um, on this announcement. The Manhattan Institute are, you know, by far my favorite conservative think tank, and I worked for them proudly from the year 2002 to the year 2010. And I really like almost all of their ideas about race. You're never going to like everything, but their general program was one that was genuine, is one that is genuinely devoted to helping black people who need help. I respect their history, and I respect what they're doing now, and I utterly reject a certain snarky thing that you get sometimes, which is that if there are some donors to the Manhattan Institute whose views a person for some reason disapproves of, then that means that anybody who has anything to do with the Manhattan Institute is tarred as a moral reprobate because of whatever you think of the, those particular donors. No, that's not the way the world works. And I have 
great respect for the Manhattan Institute. They put food on my table for a good long time. Some people think that I still work for the Manhattan Institute when the simple fact is that I haven't now since you know early in the Obama administration, but I'm very much a friend of the Manhattan Institute. I appear at the occasional event. However, this is delicate, but Glenn, you and I differ in terms of what we want on our billet. And frankly, I like it to be known that what I am is somebody who teaches at a university and does a linguistics podcast and writes for the New York Times. And that's what puts food on my table. I am not a think tank employee. And because I want to get across to as much of the public as I can, whatever my ideas are, I have decided that I personally would rather my credentials be those to distract a certain kind of person from the left who I think pretends, but then they spread it around to people who maybe don't know as well as they do, pretends to think that if you have something to do with, say, for example, the Manhattan Institute, even if the person doesn't know anything about what the Manhattan Institute does, then it means that you're, you're co-opted in some way, that you're bound in some way. I would rather ward that off. Some people would say that I'm being silly, they're going to think what they want to think, et cetera. And I'm not criticizing you, Glenn, for what you're doing. However, for example, here, the fact that now the MI is going to help with the Glenn Show, that is, that is fine with me. But I think it should just be clear to people, my salary is not paid these days by the Manhattan Institute. However, it should be equally clear that it was from 2002 to 2010. They were very good to me. I am proud of what I did with the Manhattan Institute. Love the people. However, that is not the case now. Well said. Uh, necessary. Everybody needs to understand that. John doesn't work for the Manhattan Institute. He doesn't want that on his CV or whatever. He did at one time, but he doesn't anymore. But he has respect for the Manhattan Institute. I think I can say that. Um, and uh, I do have a, a relationship with the Manhattan Institute, which includes an appointment as a senior fellow. I'm a so-called Paulson fellow. That's the a philanthropist who's uh, funded the fellowship that I have. And I have been a senior fellow. This is not new that I am a fellow with the Manhattan Institute. And for that, I do receive a stipend unconnected to the content or the proceedings of the Glenn Show uh, based on my writing and scholarship as a person who investigates these questions that, and opines about them that I do in the spirit of the policy research that the Manhattan Institute fosters. I want to say a couple of things. Yeah, they're conservative. Uh, I think that they're sensible, moderate, smart, uh, decent conservatives. But they're conservatives, and I'm affiliating with a conservative think tank. You're all going to just have to get used to it. If you didn't know that I had conservative leanings after that conversation with uh, Richard Wolf, you're never going to know it. So, so there, there's that. Um, I have confidence in the leadership of the organization, which is now under the direction of a, a relatively new president, Raihan Salam, who is a terrific person, is a deeply thoughtful and a very smart, well-read, serious man, uh, and uh, am glad to be uh, now uh, able to work with them. I have some changes that are going on. In my uh, professional life, in a way, I'm kind of following in your footsteps a little bit, John. You left a tenured position on the faculty of the University of California, Berkeley, that just about everybody in your profession would die for, and walked across the country and took up a job in 2002 at the Manhattan Institute as a fellow there, uh, and surrendered your tenure. That was an extraordinary thing. I'm not doing anything quite so bold. But I am, effective September 1st, entering into a three-year phase retirement program here at Brown University in which I will go to halftime in my faculty position. I will be teaching a halftime load and reduced administrative responsibilities uh, in return for reduced salary, of course, uh, as a part of, uh, I'm now in my 74th year. My 74th birthday is coming very soon. Um, and. Um, I'm, I'm making a change in the profile of my professional life and uh, want to give more space for my engagement with public affairs and for my writing, thinking, speaking, uh, and publishing at the Substack newsletter uh, in the, on the issues that animate me, that you've heard me rant about regularly here at The Glenn Show, that you and I both care a great deal about. And my affiliation with the Manhattan Institute 
will facilitate me doing that. It'll be a platform from which I will be amplifying my public intellectual footprint. Uh, I will maintain total editorial independence at the Glenn Show. They're not telling me what guests to have on. They're not telling me what to say. Uh, I am my own boss at the Glenn Show, at the newsletter, at the Substack. Uh, and we are going to continue to do what we've been doing there. Uh, we will have, from time to time, the occasion and opportunity to benefit from synergies with Manhattan Institute, inviting fellows on who might be doing interesting work, writing books and so on that we want to discuss here. Maybe from time to time you'll join me in that, John, although I don't ask you to make any commitment. Uh, but it may be of interest. So, so that's what's happening. And the other thing that I want to say is we are getting some support at the Glenn Show from the Manhattan Institute, but we still need and very much want the support of our viewers and listeners. Thank you very much for making the Glenn Show uh, possible and so successful so far. Those of you who have subscribed uh, to the Glenn Show's uh, uh, Substack, uh, we, we really appreciate it. But the Manhattan Institute is enabling me to increase the security of our staff, our excellent editor at the newsletter, Mark Sussman, and our excellent creative director at the podcast and newsletter, Nikita Petrov, uh, whom you have heard of if you follow The Glenn Show here in the past. These guys are tremendous contributors to what we're doing, and uh, they are now working more or less full time for The Glenn Show. That's right. We have a staff here uh, and that has been facilitated by the partnership uh, with the Manhattan Institute. So, so that's what we're doing. Uh, and thank you, John, for your forbearance and allowing uh, allowing me to give this uh, description and for your, your your faithfulness and sticking with the Glenn Show. And I look forward to you know us continuing to do good stuff together here. We're going to keep it going. All right. Well. Uh, maybe we'll sign off now, uh, and unless you've got something else burning on your mind that you want to talk about. Today, I actually don't. And so, yeah, I would be open to signing off just for today. Let me call your attention to the latest post that's going up today at the newsletter, which is Clifton Roscoe, our faithful correspondent uh, who lives in Atlanta and writes about race and politics oh, in America, yes. writes in his uh, email distribution list of which I am a recipient. Uh, and he objected to our treatment of Herschel Walker in our last uh, conversation. You, were, you wrote a blistering critical comment, a column for the Times on Herschel Walker, the But black I didn't know much about Republican. the history of the association between him and the Republicans. Sen right. I openly admit that. Yeah. So Clifton gives a I, a bird's eye account from the ground in Atlanta of what the phenomenon of Herschel Walker and Georgia politics actually consists of, which we kind of missed in our uh, gloss on that uh, in our last conversation. So I want to call that to everybody's attention. He's right. Clifton yeah. Rascal's yeah. piece at glennlowry.substack.com, uh, which is up today. Okay, John, we're going to have to make a QA and a uh, appointment sometime soon. Definitely. And uh, I'm going to ask that people... Uh, on the staff, that's you, Mark, that's you, Nikita, post the solicitation for questions for the July Q&A, which John and I will get to in a week or so. All right. Signing off for now, John. Talk to you very soon.